So um, for the rest of the session today, uh, we've got probably about 90 minutes with we'll maybe a 10 minute break. We're going to discuss current plans with County SM within the CP4C community. So I've said before, you know, you can share slides or verbal remarks. Um, if you have slides, please have uh, send them to Katie uh, so we can include them in the archive of the meeting. But each of you can share slides. Um, I'm going to start because I got a slide here <laughs> and uh, I just wanted that uh, Luke is not here to present it. Um, so this is an example of an ongoing application um, simulations using um, Kenny SM 5.1 on Niagara to uh, to do some science. So um, we're leading Kenny SM's contribution to the Regional Aerosol Model Intercomparison Project, which has the acronym RAMIP. And the idea of RAMIP is to break down this experiments that have uh, 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 been used to to uh, understand aerosol uh, responses to anthropogenic aerosol forcing in climate. So Robert, the basic idea is to take the global aerosol emissions uh, uh, profiles and break them down regionally, basically by continental region. Um, and th there's been a lot of work in this because Luke is working actually both inside ECC and outside uh, it, on, on, on Niagara. He's kind of bridging both to do this work and get things going. And especially uh, with the seamorization project that Clint um, worked hard on, uh, he uh, Luke has needed to, to work uh, closely on that because uh, RAMIP requires uh, uh, various customized outputs for for its uh, um, for its protocol. So we're now finally actually doing. Um, <laughs> yes, you're 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 right. You know, I I, I take that point. <laughs> it's more the appearance. The appearance is very nerdy. <laughs> so it's it's it's. I'm I'm talking about something that really is uh, a little. I shouldn't respond. I, I'll 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 ignore that for Um. So so regarding this here, um, I would just say that the um, the uh, well, what uh, Luke is doing right now is doing production runs and he has some regional runs done. Or that, that are ongoing, but they're not quite uh, ready to analyze yet. Um, so, but one thing that we face in this project is signal to noise. Um, there's various, we, uh, all the anthropogenic aerosol signals are, are kind of weak. And so he's using a, a, a relatively new method of, of, of filtering, um, uh, which is, uh, as a title, signal to noise patterns developed by Rob Wills. Um, to provide uh, kind of uh, one filter on and, and to reduce the number of realizations potentially needed to get a systematic signal to the forcing. Um, and basically what he's found so far is that for the global forcing, and this is what I'm showing uh, here, for the global, uh, the response to global forcing and not regional forcing, um, it turns out that the, the uh, 10 realizations we have are pretty robust and the, and the signal to noise patterns um, the leading uh, few signal to noise patterns actually reproduce the ensemble mean uh, fairly well. So the ensemble mean seems to be enough. But what you can see in the yellow uh, versus the black over here in this uh, in, in this panel is that we're getting a temporal filter uh, through this signal to noise uh, pattern uh, uh, filtering. Okay, and what we also get as value added is uh, leading contributors uh, ordered by their the robustness basically the, the variance explained. Um, in terms of the regional response to aerosols, uh, and so these, so say SNP one is the dominant pattern, okay, and that has a particularly like robust uh, appearance um, in response to aerosol uh, anthropogenic aerosol driving um, over the projected period uh, going to up to twenty fifty. So this is our beginning of an analysis here. It, it's not, um, it, it's not uh, by, by no means complete, but but what we're going to do then is apply this to the regionally forced uh, signals as well. So that's all. I, honestly, that's all I have to say. You're lucky. Okay, um, I can I can stop talking now. But um, Katie, I wanted to know, like, what how how what do we have for, for Paul? Should go next, I think, because yeah, I sent a list. Okay, great. Uh, Paul Myers was first. Yeah. Okay, great. So Paul, I'm gonna I'll, I'll stop sharing here and I'll stop talking, which is a good thing. <laughs> all right, and then I'll I'll uh, let, let let others take the floor. Thanks a lot. Sure. Thank you. And I'll apologize to everyone in advance that I will miss the end of the round table because I'm at two concurrent virtual meetings today and I'm giving a talk in the other one later in an hour or so. Um, but what I wanted to talk since, as Paul said, and as Neil presented previously and, and Jim in that, Nemo is an important part of, uh, no, let me get my white window, uh, share.
Can people see my colorful fleet slide? Yeah, we see um, your team's window. Oh, OK. So you're not seeing just the slide. We're only seeing your team's window. Oh, joy of teams. One yeah. second. Gotta love, it. Gotta love it, right? I know. And ah, entire screen. That's the button I needed to push. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, do you see slides? In the background. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, so. As I said, you know, with Nemo the thing uh, being heavily involved in Can ESM, I wanted to talk about some of the Nemo type of activities that we've got going. I've prepared way more slides than are needed, and don't worry, I'm not going to take too much time. They're just here for reference, so people can look at them afterwards. Um, but as uh, you know, as people have said, Nemo is the ocean component of Can ESM, so that's where we want to make contributions through CP4C as well as we've got a proposal in through the, for the ECC call as well for uh, doing a lot of links uh, with NEMO as well as Canada's Three Oceans develop, Regional Downscaling Developments. And our group is going to focus on the physical and biogeochemical components. People have been talking about NEMO upgrades. We're in the process of looking at the upgrade to the latest version of NEMO. How does that speed things up? How uh that makes things faster how to represent mixed layers how to link to glacial and river runoff and include that in the model uh roles of tidal mixing the sea ice model representation eddies in comparison with observations in high resolution models we've mainly been doing tests in a regional configuration but we're now also running the orca 025 e orca 025 associated with uh, can ESM so we can run it in ocean mode model to test it and then actually see how that changes in the couple system. As I said, we've been running mainly in regional quarter and 12th degree uh, configurations. We've been including testing roles of things like icebergs, simplified biogeochemical model. We may switch to the more complicated one Jim's using or Nadia Steiner in the future. We've been really playing with how you couple runoff, actually linking in a hydrological model output uh, to drive fluxes, and potentially even eventually biogeochemistry and heat, because there's big changes in runoff into the Arctic. That's a very important process. And that really changes how the freshwater content on the shelves versus the interior behaves. Uh, so that's going to be very important, uh, given more melting in the future, more river runoff, for looking at systems and behavior around the Canadian coast, and then the feedback on the ecosystems and the biogeochemistry. Icebergs change the distribution of fresh water in the Atlantic. I'm just going highlighting some things. I'm not going to go into any detail that people want to ask. We've been looking at parameterizations like the Fox Kemper mixed layer parameterization, how it changes and tides, how they change exchange into the Labrador Sea. And we really find that as we add these parameterizations, because core degree models are nowhere near eddy rich, don't include all the eddies, you get much better representation of uh, behavior in the Labrador Sea. And if you look at the black, which the observed Arbigo floats, as we put these additional mixing factors in, the, especially the solid bars, you can see them getting closer and closer to the observations. There's also reductions in space. So these parameterizations are potentially, we're, we're seeing them in the ocean only, we're going to test them next in the Orco to five, and then they should go into the. We'll test in a couple can ESM run, hopefully in the future. Uh, and these eddies are very important because they really change the stratification in the Labrador Sea. Resolving the eddies stratifies it, has less convection, which affects the AMOC and the role of eddies. And we're really seeing this actually doing experiments up to one kilometer, one sixtieth to look at the eddies and then try to put them down into the course of resolution. 160th, of course, gives you cool animations, but you can really see eddy formation, eddy spinoff, and it really plays a role in setting stratification, where the freshwater goes, how you get shelf basin exchange. That's very important for the ocean modeling and then the climate system, and also really gets the AMOC much closer to the observations. We're playing also with really high resolution for the entire Arctic. Again, gives you some really cool animations with eddies that we're trying to understand processes so we can then 
see how that relates to some of the uh, coastal downscaling systems and things around Canada. Global, as I said, that's important for because that's what Ken ESN uses. And global is really important. This may be a complicated figure, but it's looking at the freshwater content of the Beaufort Gyre in the Arctic. And basically, um, regional runs cannot get the freshwater structure right in the Arctic. Global runs can, obviously, with some feedback through Bering Strait and exactly what that is we're trying to uh, uh, look at. And the final thing, because the new version of Nemo is switching to a multi-category model, SI3, we're looking at single and multi-category models in the global setup. How does that change their structure? How does that change their ice? How does that change then, again, the structure, the circulation in around the Canadian Arctic and the East Coast? So I've done a huge number of slides in a very little time. Um, but as I said, this is just what I wanted to throw out because just a summary of things we're working on that are going to be relevant for linking with people, what others are doing in CP4C with ECCC and uh, CAN ESM. So where's my stop sharing button? Um, I've lost the stop share. Yeah, you're not sharing anymore. You're oh, okay, sharing. I did stop. Okay, sure. that's what I have. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. So we, we had just beginnings of a discussion about about you know how about Nemo working with Nemo, and I I just think it's there's so much you can do with that model. And I was thinking a lot about the offline like offline testing we could do, you know, driving Nemo with that with boundary conditions from Can ESM, but playing you know all sorts of games with Nemo. So that you know that seems like a real opportunity there. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, so we definitely uh, propose doing some of that and then looking at how that affects the, the physics, the biogeochemistry, the ice, and then trying to understand then how it can go back into the couple version. Any other questions for Paul or comments? How many presentations do we have? Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven, seven ish. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, go ahead. I do have a quick question for Paul. Yeah, um, th thanks for this. Yeah, I'm more interested in, in, in the workflow. So are you running Nemo um, in a standalone mode or couple to Can ESM? And then I wonder, sort of, how have you been running? Have you had collaborations internal to CCCMA or how, how have you approached this work? So at the moment, we've run it in the standalone mode. We've run the, the, the ocean component. That's the next step, assuming we get funding and then I get a person uh, or, you know, we'll, we'll still do it, but depending on what rate, uh, we're then going to try doing it in the, the coupled system. So we haven't run it coupled ourselves yet. That's next on the workflow. Okay, thanks. Okay, why don't we move, why don't we move on? To okay, next? we move on to the next person. Anson, are you ready to share your slide? Yep. Yeah, um, yeah, I didn't prepare as many <laughs> slides. <laughs> uh, you'll introduce yourself, okay? Yep. Um, so I'm Anson Chung. I'm a um, first year master's student uh, in Paul's um, Fisheries group. Um, and my, I'm just going to give a brief overview of, um, of my project. Um, so my project involves looking at the climate that um do the fire emission forcing in a hypothetical um nuclear war scenario and the reason is part of the future of life institute um fund project and the reason we're doing this is to raise awareness on this topic um, of nuclear winter which dates dates back to um in 80s um so the main idea behind this is that um in a hyper hypothetical nuclear war scenario. Um, the, the black carbon and some organic carbon aerosols emitted from the um, intense fire um, of nuclear detonation could could in um, could be injected into the stratosphere and stay, stay there for a long time um, by absorbing um, solar radiation and becoming self-lofting. Um, and so one commonly considered scenario is the is a 150 teragram of black carbon um, injected in the stratosphere, corresponding to um, about like all of the arsenals, um, all of the uh, 
the nuclear warheads between USA and Russia, um, which is about 4,100 um, um, weapons of 100 kiloton nukes. And, um, but I'm doing this with Kenya Sam and even with a 20 teragram black carbon um, scenario between USA and Russia, um, you can really see strong cooling signal um, from, um, from, from the global mean surface temperature. And um, the idea is that um, there will be stratospheric heat, heating due to these aerosol, um, due, due to the absorption of um, solar radiation, and there will be intervention of um, solar radiation that reaches the surface. And so you, you're seeing this really strong cooling signal. And what I'm showing here is a one star deviation um, mean surface temperature um, from climatology um, and the anomaly associated with it. And this is, keep in mind, it's just one realization I'm showing. So it's, it's not really a full analysis. And, and on the top right is the, um, is the black carbon burden change um, in the first two weeks um, from the simulation. So we injecting 20 teragram of black carbon between uh, in the in the lower stratosphere between uh, 150 hectopascale to 300 hectopascale over USA and Russia at a constant rate over one week. And this is what the evolution of uh, black carbon looks like in the first two weeks. Um, so you see it's being transported by these Rossby waves in the mid latitudes. And um, eventually they, they would um, also be transported um, throughout um, the whole globe um, by rhodopsin circulation. And um, we can also take a look at the, this is the climatology of the rhodopsin circulation, the major circulation in the stratosphere. Um, what I'm showing here is the transform Eulerian mean master uh, mass stream function. So red here would be a transport that is um, and this zonal mean in um, red here would be a a transport that is um, clockwise and blue would be counterclockwise. So in the um, so the rhodopsin circulation is dom dominated in the uh, in the winter pole. Um, so in, in, in December, January, and February, um, you see a dominant pattern in the, um, in the um, Northern Hemisphere. Um, and I also look, I'm also looking at the response um, of this um, injection of aerosol um, in the first winter and second, second uh, Northern Hemisphere winter. Um, um, so, so in the first winter, it's still a um, in the transient state, but after that, um, beginning in the second winter and so on, you see a weakening of the rhodopsin circulation and and a shift in the in a, a polar shift in the um, in the winter pole circulation and um, and we're still looking into why this is happening um, and. Yeah, that's basically what I'm working on with Kenya Sam. Um, any questions? Any questions for Anson? Okay, if there's no questions, then we'll move on to the next person. Um, Robert, are you ready to share your slides? Uh, I think so. Whenever you're ready. You see that? Yep. Perfect. OK, great. Uh, so I'm going to talk about um, a project that I'm hoping to have a PhD student starting on in September. Um, and uh, I, I guess I, I took the rule about the, the number of slides very literally. So I just cut my, my one slide up into four pieces. Uh, so if you look up uh, in the top left, this is showing the evaporation biases uh, for CAN ESM. And I, I, I always feel bad when I point at uh, biases in can ESM, but I, I should say these biases are really common amongst all CMIP6 models. This isn't a problem unique to can ESM. It seems to be pretty unique across all the CMIP models where there's too much evaporation over the oceans in the tropics, uh, and there's not enough evaporation uh, in the western boundary currents over the ocean. Uh, and this creates a lot of different biases. Uh, one that uh, myself and some collaborators have looked at uh, is the effect this has on partitioning the total heat transport between the ocean and the atmosphere. 
Uh, so the solid black curve is an observational estimate of the ocean heat transport, um, and the dashed line is the uh, ocean heat transport that you get from the models. The green line is kind of a hypothetical uh, calculation we did where we try to essentially uh, imagine that just the turbulent fluxes, so the evaporation and the sensible heat flux, were corrected to be the same as what you get in the observations. And what you see is that that basically corrects for uh, the um, heat transport bias over the, the tropical oceans. Uh, and so there's been a bunch of other experiments around this. Uh, one in the bottom left, uh, this is an experiment where uh, some uh, friends of mine at the University of Washington uh, basically tried to take the CSM model and just nudge the winds at the surface. Uh, and when they did this, they found that nudging the winds at the surface has a really large impact uh, on the surface latent heat flux or the surface evaporation over big chunks of the ocean. So this is just over the subpolar gyre, but you can see that in the control model, there's a lot more evaporation um, than in the wind nudge model. Um, and so I've been talking with, with Michael Sigmund about uh, basically trying to use some of the, the wind nudging uh, techniques that have been developed with the Candy SN model um, and basically try to uh, go through some of these experiments or do some of our own experiments uh, to really understand what is the role of wind nudging in creating these ocean circulation biases and then how that feeds back on the surface fluxes between the ocean and the atmosphere um, and how that impacts things like partitioning of the heat transport between the ocean and the atmosphere, uh, and also how this impacts hydrology. Because you can imagine that if you have these big evaporation biases at the surface in the model, uh, these are going to feed back into regional precipitation biases as well. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that we can use these wind nudge models to understand the role of uh, dynamics in setting the coupling of the ocean and the atmosphere together, and how that impacts everything from, from heat transport to hydrology. Um, I'll just say two things at, at the end here. One is that uh, in terms of timeline, like I said, this is uh, hopefully going to be a PhD student project, um, and the PhD student doesn't start until September. So realistically, I can't see us doing anything more than maybe some test integrations uh, much before April. Um, so it's maybe a bit longer term than some of the projects that have, have already started or already in the midst of starting. Um, and the other thing is I'm, I'm showing uh, just one uh, project here, but I've also been talking with uh, Karsten Abraham and Colin Goldblatt uh, about looking at some, again, either analyzing some experiments that have been done or doing some of our own runs uh, to take a look at water vapor in the UTLS region um, and doing this, uh, hopefully to compare with some of the future Hawk measurements. Um, yeah, so I can, I can answer any questions or I can stop sharing and move along. Um, Sorry, we just, I, 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 I can't see the, the screen or anything, so I, I have no clue what people want. Um, Does anyone have any questions? So, um, Robert, we were, I was dealing with a technical issue here, and so I just wanted to, to clarify. Um, in terms of like when you wanted to do this, you're saying that there was like some constraint on on when the student like when the student comes and that that kind of thing. Is that what you were saying? I'm sorry if I misheard it. Oh yeah, sorry. So just. Um, the this this is going to be part of a PhD student project, and the student's not starting until September. So right. realistically, uh, you know, there's going to be some some spin up time with the student. Uh, and so I, I I can't imagine that we're going to be starting runs before April. So this is I'm I'm just saying that I'm on uh, kind of a different timeline uh, than some of the people who are either doing runs now or planning on starting runs in the near future. Um, these yeah. are more sort of long term plans. But but if you think about it. Like actually, that is a suitable timeline to talk about because it's a year ahead. But we have to we have to write a proposal in six months, right? For resources yes. for the three, three years uh, starting in a year from now. So so it's not it, it's it, this is the time scale like thinking ahead, especially about compute resources. I'm not saying that you know you're necessarily like want well, that all the runs should happen on you know uh, shared resources, but just to think about that, that our a, a year is not. Uh, too far ahead by any means. Like we've been thinking about a lot of the runs we're doing for for at least that. I think you kind of know that, um, but uh, for sure this is the right time to start thinking about those uh, those issues. Uh, there was yep, another. No. Neil, I just wanted to clarify. Neil, yeah. Oh yeah, thanks, Robert. Uh, uh, looks interesting. Just to point out that the, another thing that would be needed is, um, you know, for a a special configured uh, experiment configuration to be made available because like you know it's for example you want to do wind nudging you have to have all the 
the files that you're going to nudge the winds towards, but also um, yeah, all the set of like switches in the model that's going to cause it to do that. So that wouldn't be, you know, in those like six experiments that I showed yesterday, although you might just be running a regular historical experiment, but you're going to have to add a bunch of stuff onto it. So just to point out also like, it'd be good to submit to CP4C, hey, this is the functionality that I'm looking for um, well before so that we can kind of like plan on making that available. Um, you know, if we have a, like if we know about it well before and then there's a date, then we can organize to make that happen. Yeah, yeah, my, Michael and I have been talking a bit about it. Uh, I think the functionality we want is already in the model, but uh, I'll definitely let you know as, as we discuss more. Yeah, sorry, it's, yeah. It's, a, it's a different, it's not a, a question about whether the functionality is in the model, which for sure it is, because we do when nudging all the time. It's a question yeah. about whether that functionality is available in what's in the CPC4C configurations. I see. Those things are not necessarily exactly the same. Just because it's possible in the model doesn't mean that it's possible in those CP4C configurations. So yeah, it's just a slight kind of nuance. So yeah, I would just suggest submitting that kind of like kind of feature request, I guess, to CP4C. Okay. Yeah, in fact, yeah. Uh, in fact, that's that's a that's a thanks very much, Neil, for for mentioning that. So if it's if you're if you're you want to get involved with cp 4 c and you're having a conversation with somebody inside C6CMA, I think we should make it clear. Like Neil, it's, Neil, you're going to deal with this internally as well. Is that that's the kind of thing we should list as part of the cp 4 c to do list. It's it, even if it's was going to be handled offline anyway. It, should, it that actually represents in kind support that ECCC is providing. Um, we don't have to have anything to do with what the ultimate solution. I'm not saying that. I mean, it's not a control thing, but it's just to point out that this, this stuff is happening and, and, and to make a note of it. I mean, it's real time that Michael's putting into it, um, that you're putting into it, Robert. And so it's just a way of sort of keeping track of all these uh, effectively investments in each other's, <laughs> you know, in, in, in the project. So just to, so so it's I, I know it's a bit managerial, but yeah. That's our point. Yeah, just just to add to that, um, you know, I think you know, when people, I think we should be clear, and we yeah, we have to make this clearer that will come in that kind of policy guidance. Um, but you know, like so, Environment Canada has kind of representatives on the CP4C steering committee, and there's like a channel for model configurations and information to flow from Environment Canada to CP4C. That's kind of different than the scientific collaboration where you just kind of, um, you know, speak to a scientist and then expert in the area. And so, you know, I've just, I caution people just because an individual scientist at CCCMA says, hey, we can do this thing in the model. That doesn't, like, again, I'm kind of repeating myself, but that doesn't mean that it's possible to do it in CP4C. Like, those, like we, I think we do need to be clear that there's a, there's a difference between those things. So, so even though you've had that conversation with an individual scientist, that's great. That's the starting point. Yes, it's possible in the model. Then there's kind of a step two, which is, can we make that functionality available via the CP4C configuration? Maybe it's already available. Great, then we don't have to do any work. But it could be that, no, actually something additional needs to be done, like in this case. I guarantee you, like, yes, we can do that in Environment Canada, but we cannot do it on Niagara today. So we would right. need to yeah. do work to enable that functionality on Niagara, which is like not something that Michael would probably do. That's probably something that yeah. Clint yeah. and I would kind of do in consultation with Michael. So it's just to kind of clarify that there's this different pathway that when people do need new functionality, and I think this is what Paul's going to mention on that um, GitLab issue tracker, you know, if we can have people request, hey, this is a functionality that I'm looking for, then we can make sure that that technology kind of like flows through the pipeline, kind of, of course, in consultation with the relevant experts. But um, yeah, we do have to just clarify that there is a, a kind of pathway for it. It's not just because it's available in EC that it works outside. Yeah, thanks. And, and not not to pick on you, Robert, but it's it, it, it's 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 a great case in point. And just to say, like, it also enhances the transparency and shows everyone how how you how to how to collaborate, right? Like, so if you you bring in this feature request, you know, you have there's a scientific um, motivation, and then there's technical work required to implement it. And so people will will get a sense then of like what's actually needed, and that will and we won't have to defend. Oh, how did that, how come this person got this or that? You know, like it went it went through a process, and we had a process for doing it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Um, and so, so the, the, that's that's why the issue tracker, I think, is 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 become a, like a critical piece for this. Is that we can we can show where when it came in. You, so you like we we have a lead time now of a year, right, or something like roughly, right. And um, and and it's not uh, you know even it might not be a it's not going to be a year's work, but it's finding that few days inside that year for for it to happen. That that's the that that's the the, the key part. Anyway, I, enough hammering on you. Sorry, but it's 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 a great it's a great case in point. So uh, uh, thanks a lot.